There is a moment in the cold open of the Philippou Brothers' smash hit horror film Talk To Me, in which Cole, the concerned brother of partygoer Duckett, lashes out at a group of teens and 20-somethings for recording Duckett's bizarre behavior with their phones instead of helping him. It's a moment that, to me sitting in the theater, was more shocking than the eventual climax of the scene in which Duckett inexplicably stabs his brother before plunging the knife into his own face. The Philippou brothers have acknowledged that the film is a metaphor for numbing the pain of trauma with drugs. The term drugs here being a broad range of things that you allow into your body for the sole purpose of forgetting the problems of your life for a little while. But their other underlying theme is one that is connected to the brothers' status as YouTube sensations with the channel Raka Raka prior to making their feature debut. And that is the absence of a private space to deal with things like grief, isolation, or just the existential horror of being a teenager. In fact, Duckett's opening story is based on a real-life incident Danny Philippou witnessed as a teenager, where a mutual friend of theirs was experimenting with drugs and started convulsing on the floor. But instead of helping him, everyone just took out their phones and started recording. Jump scares and body horror are evergreen horror tropes, but for a story to truly get under your skin, there has to be identification with the story or characters on a deeper level. Yes, a severed head growing spider legs and scurrying around the room is horrific, but the deeper horror comes in not knowing if your friends are really your friends. A baby with demon eyes is horrific, but the deeper horror is the complete loss of your body autonomy and your sanity. As Danny Philippou explains, we are always interested in the age where you go from being a kid to being an adult, where you're still taking risks, but now the consequences are more brutal, where you're just trying to have fun, but now hidden emotions convince you of negativity that isn't real. You are your own worst enemy. And it's the mutually reinforcing themes of drug use, reliance on social media, and internet perpetuated loneliness that hold me at arm's length. Which means I can never really appreciate Talk To Me in the way that those of a different culture, or especially a younger generation, can. Using drugs to deal with loneliness and recording your friend's near-death experience for the gram are as alien to me as the explanation of Skibbity Toilet. Seriously, I looked it up and I, I know less now than I did before I read the wiki. But that's okay, because, and I cannot overstate this, not everything has to be made for me. And people who are not like me deserve to have something that they can identify with. I'll be possessing you with some spoilers, so be warned. And I let you in, so feel free to talk to me in the comments. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? I grew up in an era of Reaganomics and the possibility of nuclear holocaust hanging over my head like the Sword of Damocles. It was the outbreak of the AIDS epidemic in an era where actual adult leaders would openly scare you with homophobic rhetoric like, a gay is gonna cough on you, and you'll get infected with a mutated airborne AIDS virus. Crack cocaine was becoming a thing people had heard of. Deregulation allowed for glorified toy commercials to be pumped into my brain ad nauseum. Oh, and we switched sides on the war on homelessness to the point where the number of unhoused people quadrupled over the course of a decade. And it got so bad we had to call in Louis Anderson and Elaine Boozler to help out. Plus, you know, Aquanet. But at the end of the day, we could lose ourselves in a good book without Jeff Bezos coming to rip it away from us. And we had the privacy to sit and think about how much it sucked that Ivan Drago was going to drop an AIDS nuke on us, and only Optimus Prime and Michael Dudikoff could save us. Are those thoughts incredibly stupid? Yes, but that's my point. Prior to the internet, a stupid thought could fester in your brain for quite a while before it eventually died and was replaced by something smarter. You didn't have to be responsible at 22 for things that you tweeted when you were 12. And the decisions you made when you were 12 didn't brand you the Star Wars kid. The philosopher and pre-sociology sociologist Jeremy Bentham is probably most famous for codifying the value of utilitarianism the greatest good for the greatest number of people. But his other major contribution is that of the panopticon. As a sociologist, Bentham was interested in the idea of incarceration and rehabilitation. And his theory, which stretches all the way back to Plato's Ring of Gyges parable, is that people act morally and ethically when they know that they are being watched. 
So Bentham devised a prison in the form of a tower, where the cells are located along the perimeter and in the center is a watchtower that houses the guards. But the tower is obscured so that the prisoners don't know when they are being watched and when they aren't. Ultimately, the theory goes, you wouldn't even need guards after a while. The prisoners would just self-regulate out of the mere possibility that they were being watched. As Plato's cohort Glaucon said, a watchpot never calls the kettle black. Of course, this is all more theoretical than literal, but if it's good enough for Plato, it's good enough for us. What does all this have to do with talk to me? Well, part of the problem with the panopticon theory is that it doesn't take into account the tremendous strain the constant surveillance has on a person's psyche. Eventually, those prisoners would be more likely to engage in self-destructive behavior rather than be rehabilitated. Sure, in the short term, I might behave myself because I don't want to be punished, but over time, I start to engage in more counter-conduct, where non-conformist transgressive acts as a form of protest, even when I'm not actually being watched. You've defined yourself as a rebel, and in the absence of a repressive milieu, your societal niche has been co-opted. I see. The theory also doesn't consider that the guards might really, really get into the scopophilic aspect of watching the prisoners. So there might be those who willingly enter the panopticon because the attention they receive is treated as currency, which is what happened with millennials in the late 2000s. Likeability, sociability, and personality became commodities to be traded via social media sites, and the value of those traits was at a premium for a group of lonely, way too online people. The panopticon wasn't a prison anymore, it was the market square. And by the time Gen Z came of age, society itself had evolved into a social panopticon, with the constant presence of surveillance and co-requisite social judgment all around us, thanks to social media and those damn phones. Not only do you not need guards, you don't need a tower. Our friends, family, teachers, and co-workers will surveil us out of concern, out of policy, out of profit, or even just for the lulls. This is true even when we're just struggling to get through life. In fact, it's especially true when we're struggling. This is the case for Mia, played by Sophie Wilde, the lead character of Talk To Me. Mia is struggling to come to terms with her mother's death two years prior, and she spends more time with her surrogate family Jade, Jade's brother Riley, and her mother Sue than she does with her own father. As a matter of fact, she can barely carry a conversation with her father because the tension is so thick. You get in the cold? Uh, yeah, I think so. When we first meet Mia, she's at a remembrance wake, mourning her mother's loss, and her aunt mentions having her mother's name saved on her phone, the sort of injurious memento mori that she wants to get rid of. Riley, Mia's surrogate little brother, is also struggling, but it's mostly through the difficult time of being a teenager. He and his friend James are killing time waiting for their rides at that awkward stage of too old for this shit, but still being dependent on older people to get around town, when they bring the film's themes together in one scene. Both Riley and James are joking about one of their classmates' Snapchats for being cringe. It's the social panopticon in action. James is clearly the more mature of the two, being the kid who sells stolen cigarettes to his classmates and making blowjob jokes about his own mom. Riley isn't there yet, still having the interest of a kid, like being really into the Lord of the Rings. And that insecurity is what makes Riley so tentative about, well, everything. And despite the fact that Riley and I are separated by a continent in two decades, he and I clearly got the same just say no education about drug use. It's apparent in the conservative way we approach drugs. For me, two decades of the perils of drug abuse instilled in me an affective aversion to drugs, to the point where I still have a hard time wrapping my head around drug use that isn't for some specific purpose. But there are people who get high for no reason. Just getting high for the sake of getting high. And that boggles my Alex P. Keaton, Arnold Drummond, Jesse Spano colonized brain. The thing is, that doesn't really come from a logical part of my brain. It comes from a reactionary part of my brain that was programmed to be scared of drugs. I have to reason my way out of being judgmental when people do drugs because, oh my god, don't you remember the thing with the egg? James gives Riley flack, calling him a fetus for not wanting to smoke a cigarette and threatening to find better friends. Riley would rather be belting out chandelier with Mia, and the two seem like each other's ports in a storm, especially when they arrive uninvited to Jade's friends, Haley and Joss. That Mia is treated like a pariah and Riley like an infant is a large part of the reason why they are so gung-ho about trying the great mystical hand job that all the kids are raving about on the snappity chat. In fact, Mia gets blown off by her own best friend when she tries to share the trauma of finding a dying kangaroo in the road, or that it's the second anniversary of her mother's death. 
Jade is too wrapped up in her boyfriend Daniel to give Mia the time of day. And it's when Mia spies Daniel and Jade holding hands that she decides to dive headfirst into the possession game. Consequences be damned. And it's here where I start to part ways with the film, or at least fail to identify with the character's decisions. And it's because I never grew up with the pseudo-social peer pressure that Gen Z has, and the idea of turning to medication is anathema to me. Aren't some drugs okay? Like, I heard pot won't hurt you. Let me tell you a true story about a boy we'll call Charlie. And one day, when his little sister wouldn't steal some money for him to go and buy some more drugs, he brutally beat her. I'm certain that Michael is hyperkinetic, hyperactive. They prescribe stimulants for hyperkinesia, don't they? <laughs> some doctors do. I don't like the idea of giving the kid I'm, drugs. I'm... You know, getting into drugs and being high is a real stupid thing to do. Being original, say no to peer pressure. Say no may be the smartest thing you ever do. You gotta write. This is not to say that Gen Xers don't do our share of drugs. Many of our finest musicians and actors had drug problems. The point is Drew Barrymore's drug problem was a Drew Barrymore problem, and River Phoenix's drug problem was a River Phoenix problem, and Robert Downey Jr.'s drug problem was a Robert Downey Jr. problem. They just didn't say no hard enough. Miss Reagan, can I please shake your hand? Of course you may. Me too! So for a lot of us grunge era high top faders, watching someone use drugs to numb the pain of loneliness it's a lot like a horror fan watching someone bring a Ouija board into a haunted house. Like, this is clearly not going to go well, and the person doing it should know better. And that's why this drug metaphor is so brilliantly conceived. In 1981, just as Nancy and Ronald Reagan were taking office, a 23-year-old named Liz Mensch was interviewed for a job at the UK-based pharmaceutical and beauty retailer, Boots. As a company, Boots was nearly 140 years old at this point and they had a traditional way of doing things. Minch, who was more on the business side of things than the drug side of things, asked Boots president John Breyer about the customer base, and Breyer responded that the customers were mostly doctors. Instead, Minch said in the interview, the company should market to the people actually paying for and taking the drugs, not the people who are prescribing them. Minch got the job, and two years later, in May of 1983, just five months prior to Nancy Reagan launching her anti-drug campaign on Good Morning America, Boots aired the first ever prescription drug ad on television. If you're one of the many people who take the prescription drug Motrin, you should ask your physician or pharmacist about Rufen. Although the ad itself was fairly benign, the Food and Drug Administration felt that it would set a bad precedent, opening the floodgates to all sorts of advertising that pushed drugs in prime time. The practice was later informally banned as drug makers collectively agreed that the practice was a bad idea. The FDA allowed drug makers to advertise as long as they didn't make specific claims about health, which seemed to obviate the point of advertising. The practice lay dormant for over a decade until Shearing Plow, now a part of Merkin Company, dumped onto the airwaves a huge marketing campaign for Claritin, the company's version of the anti-allergy drug Loratadine. The company obeyed all of the FDA's rules, not even mentioning what Claritin did, who it was for, or why they should take it. The company just encouraged people to talk to their doctors and offered a financial incentive to buy Claritin. For free information and a $5 coupon toward a prescription for Claritin, call 1-800-CLARITIN. A few years later, the FDA relaxed its rules on advertising directly to consumers, so you get what we have today. Talk with your doctor about how you've been feeling to see if adding Abilify is right for you. Ask your healthcare provider for two-layer Ambien CR. Ask your doctor about Cialis for daily use and a free 30-tablet trial. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Talk to your doctor about Mirapex and RLS. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft. Ask your doctor about Plavix today, because no matter how formidable you are, you're no match for a dangerous clot. At this point, under the guise of self-care advocacy, the patient became an unwitting, unpaid lobbyist for the pharmaceutical company, while Mensch, the mastermind behind it all, turned the practice into Medici Global. But more than that, over the course of a generation, culture experienced a market shift from just say no to ask your doctor. All drugs are dumb. To avoid long-term injury, seek immediate medical help for an erection lasting more than four hours. And I know that people will argue that the drugs Nancy Reagan was talking about and the ones that Merck and company are talking about are different, but the idea of drugs being a solution to the problem, any problem, is a dramatic change in ideology. No, no. 
we went from you're a bad kid if you take drugs to you're weak if you need to take drugs to eh, we're all gonna die soon anyway. Here's a pill, kid. Stop bothering me. So the generation that absorbed a decade's worth of the evils of drugs is necessarily going to have a different take on drug use than the there's a pill for everything that ails you generation. Mia, of course, gets hit hard the first time she touches the hand, not really knowing what to expect. But the disbelieving looks on Jade, Daniel, and Riley's faces, as well as the peer pressure from the rest of the party goers, pushes her to try again. She does become the life of the party, allowing herself to be possessed by the bloated spirit of a drowned woman. The spirit develops such a fixation on Riley and has such a strong grip on Mia that Joss and Haley are not able to break the spell in the 90 second safety window. Run, run, run. Mia is seemingly fine though, despite the possession going a bit awry. She even confides in Riley the details about her mother's death and talks about her loneliness after she died. Tellingly, when Riley says she won't be alone ever again because she has him and Jade, Mia doesn't say it back to him. And Riley's loneliness is something that hangs pregnantly in the air for the first 40 minutes of the film. It's the impetus for Riley to want to try the hand the next time Joss and Haley have a party. And although Jade forbids it because he's too young, she also betrays his trust, telling everyone that he came to her crying after the first time because he was so afraid. Which is a bit of a dick move on her part, especially since it's an exaggeration. I'm mm, just bored. It wasn't until my second watch through of this movie that it occurred to me what my problem was. The first time out, I really sympathize with Jade, and Jade is Nancy Reagan. Jade, please. Riley, I said no. Just say no. If that's not the splash of cold water in the face, I don't know what is. Who you root for for the rest of the movie will determine how Talk To Me hits for you. And I mean, Jade is clearly right here. It's stupid that they're all doing this. It's stupid that they're blithely putting it on the internet. But it's especially stupid that her little brother wants to do it. But Jade is also the type of prissy little prig who views her abstinence not just as an intellectually superior decision, but a morally superior decision. Well, I think drugs are disgusting and I'd never take them. My name is Lisa and I'm a Republican. And realizing that the these kids are really stupid for doing this voice is the same as the It's Levy Osa voice makes you realize in a hurry that you're not the good guy on this one. Yes, it's correct that people probably shouldn't get high or tempt potentially demonic spirits instead of dealing with the underlying mental issues that drove them to do those things, but that judgment is a luxury I have because Punky Brewster told me so. And I got to deal with loneliness by going out and making intimate friendships instead of having the option of parasocial facsimiles. It's Jade's indifference to both Mia's and Riley's problems that isolates them in the first place. Thanks for ignoring my calls, by the way. I haven't been ignoring your calls. I've been busy. Yeah. Look, Riley, you're not nine anymore, right? She doesn't care that Mia is struggling with the anniversary of her mother's death. She doesn't care that Mia is traumatized by running across an injured kangaroo. She turns Riley away after he just watched his sister's best friend get possessed and tell him that some pedo spirit wants to split him open. And all this time she's consuming their lives through her phone rather than actually treating them like human beings. It's Mia's sympathy for Riley, the understanding that he needs to experience something like this to feel whole, that leads her to asking Joss and Haley to give Riley a taste. This is a really stupid decision on the face of it, but for some people it's worth the risk. Of course this being the kind of movie that it is, Riley's first time is a disaster. Mia asks for just 50 seconds because Riley is so young, but when Riley begins speaking to her in her mother's voice, Mia begs Haley and Joss to let it go on so that she can speak with her mother one last time. This causes Riley to go over the limit, and the spirits do a number on him, including a really gross eyeball thing. It's just... yeah. From there, Talk To Me turns into a more traditional downward spiral movie. Riley winds up in the hospital, clinging by a thread, as Jade and her mother Sue blame Mia. Compounding matters, Riley is still possessed by something that forces him into self-harm, even from the hospital. Cole, whose brother Duckett gifted the hand to Joss before stabbing himself in the face, you'll remember, tells them the only way to beat the demons is to let them detox out of the system. But Mia theorizes that they never actually close the connection by blowing out the candle, so Riley is still open to being possessed by the predatory spirits. The mixture of guilt, shame, and isolation leads Mia to steal the hand and use it to contact her mother who comforts her at first, but then begins to sell her on a paranoid fantasy about Mia's father lying about the circumstances of her death. The whole thing mirrors the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 
with the protagonist becoming addicted to the serum that changes him into Mr. Hyde, to the point where he's confused enough to think that he has to take the serum in order to prevent himself from turning into Hyde. It's important to note, though, that basically everyone tells Mia the rules of possession run counter to what she's experiencing. Daniel doesn't think that the spirit that possessed Riley was Mia's mother at all, but she insists. Joss has a throwaway line about how spirits can mimic others, but Mia is in denial. She wants so badly to be reunited with her mother that other explanations don't penetrate her walls. Of course, this makes Mia the perfect dupe for a couple of malevolent spirits who have been conning her. The first, Quain, an old pedo geezer not unlike Reverend Kane from Poltergeist 2, is the one who really has a thing for Riley. There's the bloated drown lady who may or may not be imitating Mia's mother, Rhea, the whole time, and certainly seems to be a cohort of Quain's. Or is Quain himself, since they can assume any form. There's a weird Quentin Tarantino lady who sucks on Daniel's foot. This little cutie who shows Mia the torment Riley is feeling. There's a spirit who assumes the form of Mia's father and attacks her. And there's maybe Rhea. The film is a little vague on this one. Certainly at some point Rhea is being imitated by the drowned lady, but we're not sure if that's always the case. Riley is the one who initially gets possessed by her and he's not around long enough to tell Mia who he saw. By the end though, the spirits are exploiting Mia's hope that she's talking with Rhea. The spirits conspire to convince Mia that Riley has to die in order to be spared from a hellish fate, even though the stated rules are that if you die while you're possessed, you are possessed forever. Fortunately, Jade shows up just in time to save Riley, sending Mia crashing into traffic and being stuck in her own worst nightmare. I have this recurring nightmare. Oh, I'm looking in the mirror, my reflection is gone. Like I don't exist. Mia ends the film as she started, isolated from everyone around her, but now, because she gave in to the metaphorical drug she was using to numb the pain, it's too late to turn back, and she's trapped in a world of selfish users. Ultimately, if you take anything away from this, I hope it's the knowledge that watching media is a process that includes production and consumption. And in the same way that John Carpenter is going to have a different take on a story than Howard Hawks is on the production side, because of his generation, his socioeconomic class, and yes, his politics. Every viewer is going to consume the piece differently because of their experiences. And all of those different ways of consuming the text are perfectly valid because all of those experiences are perfectly valid. Even if it's one that puts viewers like me on the outside looking in. Stay warm, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, make good choices, and I'll see you next time.